Probably the most common question I get asked is what kind of wax do you use in the bottom of your plane? And the reason we do this is to lubricate the sole so that your effort is spent pushing the blade through the wood instead of pushing the plane over the wood. Well, we contacted someone who actually produces it. We had our own formula made. In fact, we even put it in a nice little container, has our Purple Heart logo on it. And like a, a glue stick, as you wear it down, you just simply create, roll the bottom and get yourself more wax. A little squiggle along there is all it takes and makes your planing so much easier. You try it, you'll see what I mean. Get one for your tool tray and one for your shop apron. We're live. Huh? We're live. live. We're live right now. They can hear you. Yep. I can hear you. Oh, wait, just a sec, Jake. I am not getting your picture's not moving. Just a sec. Assume. What are we waiting on? Waiting on. Do we got video? No. Nope. Do we have audio? Just a second. Oh, there we go. Now we're live. We are live. Yep. Go ahead. Hi, folks. Welcome. This is our. I should stop doing this because I can never 25. remember. Twenty-five. Twenty-five. Really? Yeah. Episode. Uh, this is our twenty-fifth live YouTube workshop. Welcome. This is uh, Saturday, April twenty-fifth. And that's my, huh? uh, so tonight is our question and answer, which is a little different than anything we've done before. Just so that you know, we're working on Angie's bed desk. Where did I put that, Jake? Somewhere we put it away. Oh, up there on the stand so it wouldn't get harmed. Angie will be back to that next Saturday. But I thought we'd stop and just, thank you, Rex. We'd, uh, we would do a session to just to kind of, Answer some questions. Okay, so this just, just just a second. Yeah, what's the matter? Apparently our audio is breaking up. I, I can't tell from my end, though. Uh, it sounds like you're underwater, apparently. Underwater? Yeah. I'm going to... Uh, I feel that way sometimes. Yeah. What? I'm going to restart the mic. Just there. Check it. Huh. So, shall I sing Silence is Golden? Just a second. They wouldn't hear me. Well, no, they can hear you. They can? I won't talk to you while you're trying to figure it out. what's going on there. Just give me a second. And Jake leveled it up, and it is now going to be our, our table extension. It doesn't take up any more room than the door that we had sitting on here. Gives us a second table saw if this one is set up and being used, fences underneath. We just have to cut the slots in here so that when we use our, our uh, sliding tables, they'll be able to continue on out here. So, great idea. We just put into place our big... 16-inch thickness plan, uh, joiner. And, and wasted no time filling it up. Yeah, it's already another. 
another flat surface, we discover something is that they've got. Uh, this is not the. This is not the uh, the fence for it. There's no way they'd ever make it and leave it that big. So we're going to have to get one a piece added onto it. And I don't just the man for that. He was here today. So we opened up all of this space. We moved one d drill press over here on the wall. This is the one that we use just just for uh, drilling mallets. We moved another one back into that. Just a second. It's going to. Okay, I think. Just a second. All right, we're back. I'm going to. Uh, we don't. We'll wait a second. Sounds better. Good, good. All right. That's good enough. Yeah, sorry everybody. Sorry about that. It usually is my fault, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'll hurry up and tell you in just a minute and we'll get started. So you do this every Saturday night while the coronavirus is keeping people at home. We are your date night. And tonight is a question and answer. And we've had we uh, allow people to an submit their questions in advance so that we're prepared. We have overloaded. Gone through and picked out some. You can still submit them live, and we'll try to squeeze some more in. Kirk's going to read them off, and I'll do them. I won't say what I brought, but what we do, real quick, is for our project, this is where we raise money for her by Park. I'm not sure what that is. I feel very guilty that I don't have the question off to show you, but what I'm doing is I'm going to put it in. Off the mic. You serious? Now your mic is really low. No. Nope. Check, 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 check. There we go. Yeah. Oh, so we've up. Yeah. Sorry. Everything's good. <laughs> yeah. Technical issues. Not everything can be made out of wood. They're saying I did it on purpose. So. Yeah. Frick did it on purpose. Exactly. Megan's not here to tell us we need to quit early. So we have a special guest, uh, one of our combat wounded vets that was in our class before. Is coming. He's going to be on and introduce the program from his perspective so that you know what you're supporting. Uh, also want to make note that this, today, uh, pronounce it for me again, Jake. Th what's Anzac. today's? Anzac. This is, in Canada, we have, mem we have uh, Remembrance Day. In the United States, they have both Memorial Day and, I can't remember what the other Veterans. one is, but uh, Veterans Day, right. So this is the day that they uh, honor uh, their war dead, both Australia and New Zealand. So I thought, well, you know what? We've got an Aussie up here. His name is Ash, and uh, hopefully either he or someone else from Australia is going to be on later to explain it. We bring combat wounded veterans in six times a year. We treat them to a six-day, very intense hand tool workshop. We start at 8 in the morning. We run until 11 p.m. We eat our meals right here. Yours truly, Frick, does the barbecue, and uh, my wife and Jake's wife take care of the food. Great food, but uh, it's a lot of work. It's a ton of work. And during that course of that week, you learn to sharpen freehand. You learn to cut dovetails, mortise and tenon, half line dovetails. You learn to process lumber from rough to ready with just hand planes. Now, yeah, it costs a lot of money. We bring these guys in. We cover their airfare, their hotel, their meals. We send each vet home with approximately $3,300 $3, $3, worth of tools. We have started what's called the Bench Brigade. 
And we have, uh, we have Jack Lane down in Texas spearheading this, and he is absolutely thrilled. What we've done is we've put together, we've ma- put out a call to have anybody who's interested in helping. If you would like to be able to give back to these people who have given so much, you can be part of our bench brigade. And what you do is you take it upon yourself to build one of our benches to our spec, and then you get it, and then you take care of getting it to a vet in your area that has been to one of our programs or is going to be this coming summer. And uh, that way they have a bench and all their tools. And I, 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 in the near future, I'm going to have Jack come on. He doesn't know this. He's hearing it for the first time. And tell you just the kind of response that he's getting from the vets that we've already connected with. So if you would like to participate, you are welcome to, sp- you are welcome to join us in. Join him with us and sponsor. You can make a donation on our page. Frick will put the link up. And that money goes directly to one of those costs that I just mentioned. None of us take a salary out of this. Um, and you can also buy our, one of our T-shirts, our Purple Heart T-shirts. The response to that has been phenomenal. This one happens to be Wood Doing Good. We have Wood Is Good, and we've got a brand new one coming. And that helps spread the word. The hardest thing we have to do is to find the people who actually need our help. They tend not to be outside waving their arms, getting looking for attention. They're held up at their, in their homes. So the only way we find them is through personal contact. More people that know, better chance we're going to find them. So we, uh, as a thank you to you, yes, Rex? Gary Burnett from October 4th, 1903. Gary's Can always we, here. Oh, yeah. I can't hear Rex. So, oh, yeah. I'm sorry. Rex doesn't have a microphone. So Gary Burnett, uh, one of our combat wounded vets. Gary, welcome. He's always here. Great. If you're a combat wounded vet from our previous class, and you're on tonight, please say something so we can acknowledge and give you a shout out. I want to I want to show you tonight's draw. And we got something special. So Michael, good friend of ours, has been a big supporter of our program. I, we uh, we try to send a little bottle of Canadian maple syrup tapped right here in New Brunswick with every order that comes in a box. If it's in a padded envelope, it's too risky. So if you've been one of the uh, <laughs> recipients of this, you know how good it is. Michael said he hated maple syrup, but he tried this, drank the whole bottle. So just because of him, we now, we have a, the local supplier makes, makes the really dark stuff that we, Jake and I and everyone in our family love so much. So we now, we just got the shipment in yesterday. We now have bottles that are 250, 250 mil and 500 mil. 100. Sorry, this is 100? Yeah, that's right. 100 mil like and that? 500. So tonight's draw are for these, Everybody's, you, and we're also going to give away a half-blind kit, which includes the Herfex 10 and the half-blind, the IBC half-blind dovetail chisel, and check this out, a resin-impregnated purple-infused maple mallet. Won't you, some lucky person's going to get that. Now, we, we made some changes in the shop. Luther's been helping us. And uh, can you see if you can get Luther on the phone on FaceTime? I'd like to him to give everybody the update live and in person on uh, his what? sister. I just come over here. I want to show you. We have a, we have a, I want, I want to tell you a little something. Sometimes there's little tiny things in your life that you don't take time to take care of them. And they create just a little needling every time you go near them. And we got a couple. Anyway, um, we have this guy named Wilford. He's a, a retired uh, ma- uh, fabricator, and he's always looking for something to do. So we come he in here, and we, we have a... What? He used to look for things. He used to look for things, and now he's too busy. We have a list over there, and we have all these things that he does. So I, want to show you, I want to show you what he did for us most recently. So this is our edge sander. We use this in the production of our saws. We use this in a whole lot of things. And in order to change the belt... You had to crank this small crank in in order to take the tension off. And Ken and I both hated doing it because it was such a pain. So I said to Wilford, that is, can you fix that? So look what he did. He added a handle on there. So now when you have to adjust the tension, it's a piece of cake. You don't know how much we enjoy that. The other thing was this. To close the, you had to, take the, you had to lift this lid up. You had to lift this lid up in order to change your belt. And it had a screw in here, and you'd have to screw that down. And every time you would take it off, you'd drop it on the floor. Well, Wilford put a latch on there for us today, so now it's a two-second procedure. So two irritants no longer exist in my life. Uh, anything else we need to talk about? We can get right into them. Let's get started. 
We uh, at some point in the middle, we'll we'll introduce the Purple Heart Project. Well, we should tell them what that we have that eight-inch general or eight-inch. Oh, process. yeah. Okay. Well, actually, is Luther on? Did you get him? I don't have FaceTime. You don't? I don't have an iPhone. Well, here. Take this one. Get him on and then hook it up, if you would, please. I know, because people want to know. So just a quick tour around here. We tried to do it. We didn't have our volume. So we've gotten rid of a lot of machines. We've opened up a lot of the space to try to get this to flow better. Just when we moved in here, we had to maintain our shop, continue to produce product, while we were renovating this, this was a bowling alley, if you'll remember. That's why the arrow's on the floor. That's not to tell Ken how to get to his bench. And uh, as a result, I, what I thought was going to take us three months took us almost a year. So we just got the stuff in here. We got it hooked up. And then you start using it, and you realize, ah, this really doesn't work. The layout isn't what we want. So Luther's been helping us trying to get our layout better. So we took that bandsaw. We had that big gray we got a, I got a beautiful bandsaw if anybody's interested. It's that 20-inch Delta. We went through and we renovated the whole thing, and it works great. I would have kept it, except I'm a general fan at heart. And I ended up getting a general 20-inch just three or four months ago, and I don't need two 20-inch. Is he rare? Ready? Okay. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put a halt to this for just a second. I'm, a lot of you were, uh, have asked me numerous times about Luther's sister. Alice came down with the coronavirus, and uh, she was intubated. She was on. Uh, she was in bad shape. In fact, he texted me one night and said the doctor said she's crashed and they don't expect her to live the night. But there is great news, and I'm on, I want to put a face to the name, and I'm going to have Luther tell you exactly what's going on and update you on Alice. Luther, you there? He's coming. Luther, turn your uh, turn your stream off. You didn't have to get yourself all prettied up for this. Well, what the heck? <laughs> Knock yourself out. <laughs> Speak. So am I on? Yep. Uh, well, you you stole half my thunder there, but yeah. Uh, so here's the update on Alice. Like Rob told you. She uh, 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 came down with a cough, took her to the hospital, tested coronavirus. She has um, uh, some underlying conditions, and uh, the doctors called and told us, hey, it's, you know, uh, chances of her surviving the night are super slim. And uh, it, it went really, really fast. Well, she... You know, they put her on. A, she did survive the night. Put her on a ventilator. They had to put her on a feeding tube. She was completely unresponsive, and she was that way for about uh, about a week. Um, slowly, she got uh, more responsive. Uh, a couple of days ago, they took out the feeding tube and the ventilator, and uh, two days ago, or three now, this is the third day, she uh, left the left the ICU. Uh, for rehab, and, uh, I got a video of her uh, going out down the hall and all the nurses and everybody clapping because uh, one of the nurses told me, you know, she's our she's our story because she was the worst that they had had that they were able to uh, uh, keep alive uh, and and recover. So uh, I, I know a lot of people out there were praying. I really appreciate that. Um, and you can see the power of, of prayer and the power of hope. So just thanks for everybody. And uh, she continues to cover. She's not out of the woods yet, but she's in a much, much better place. Thank you. Way to go. And if she ever watches this, we're all pulling for you, Alice. Okay, where was I? Yeah, go back. Yeah. Okay, so uh, we're, we're going to show them down here. Oh, oh, yeah. So anyway, so we uh, we took our big we had a we had a twelve inch joiner. We took that out, sold that, and we now have our sixteen inch joiner that we moved into place, which I nicknamed uh, an aircraft carrier because if you were to look at it from that end, you'd see what I mean. You literally could land a plane on that. It is so big, great to have. It's wired up. Um, what are we waiting on? Wiring it up. Oh, I thought it was wired up. 
The only thing we notice is that the guard is not the original guard. I didn't realize that. They would never leave you with four inches of unprotected blade. So we'll get uh, Wilford, our magic man, to come in here and modify this. And we'll probably do a, a live episode one night when we actually set the knives. Can't wait to do that. Favorite thing. We're, I think we're going to leave the straight knife on there. So you'll notice that almost all of our machinery is green. It's all general, as far as the eye can see, except look at this bad boy. So this is a probably 1970s vintage Rockwell 8-inch jointer. We went in and modified it with the bird, the original bird segmented head, which makes a jointer a beautiful thing. And uh, what did we put on it for a motor? Do you remember? Horse and three-quarter. Right, oh, horse and three-quarter motor, single phase, magnetic switch, the whole bit. All done up. Works beautifully, but it's the wrong color. We found an 8-inch general that we're going to do the same thing to. So if anybody's looking for a great deal on a jointer, contact us. It's looking for a home. All right, now can we go? We're a little bit behind. When are we going to do, how many people do we have on? Not enough. 542. Okay, when are we bringing, who are we bringing in? Ash. Ash? Ash. If not Ash, Paul. But do we know that yet? Well, when you have them ready, you let me know. Let's do the first question. All and right. hardly wait. All right, so just so, just so everybody knows, we've had over 100 questions, so we're not going to be able to uh, get to all of you them. You know what we're going to say the whole night? No. But we have plenty of ammo for uh, the next okay, one. Okay, so tell them the name and where they're from. All right, so the first question, and we're doing this in chronological order, in the order that we receive them. Uh, Doug from Utah. Hi, Doug says, can you demonstrate jointing the long edge of a board too long for your shooting board? Maybe something three to four feet long. I've seen demonstrations with purposely curved plane blade in a jointer plane or a jointer plane with a fence, but do you do anything different with your relatively straight blades? Or yep. is there a difference? Um, I'll do the first one. So if you're trying to joint, I mean, you can, you can joint like this. Hold your board in the vise and join it. Now, the only problem with doing this is you're having to balance it so that you're keeping the board square to the face at the same time you're trying to straighten the edge. What I do oftentimes is this. I will take uh, another piece of wood. I'm just going to buzz this in half real quick. So it needs to be dimensionally stable, meaning accurately milled. Get my bench dog in here. Get the spacing just right. I'm going to put this piece underneath down here. I'll put this piece up here. Now the boards are there to keep the boards are there to keep the piece I'm working on elevated slightly and then I can use my my bench as a shooting board the uh, plane is square it has to be I can't do it down on the bench because you'll end up running into this area where there is no blade so it's elevated and I can go in keep that piece out of the way and I can plane that edge using the sole of the plane to keep the board straight and using the setup I have here to keep it square. That's the best way I know to join, accurately joint a long board too long for your shooting board. With the other and, and as far as the blade edge, there are those who camber the blades. That means that when they, and David and I disagree on this, David Charlesworth, that he's a fan of cambering the blade. So if I can pull out a blade and I'll show you. What they would do is they would take their plane blade, or he would take his plane blade, and he would put a slight radius on it. So instead of it being straight, shortest distance between two points, he has a slight radius. I don't do that. I much prefer the method that Alan, or Ian Kirby originally taught, and that was that the blade is straight from side to side, but you simply feather with a little bit of finger pressure on your 16,000 grit stone so that you just feather off that outside corner and that outside corner. And uh, the other day, we were filming, and it's on YouTube. So if I think it was the last, wasn't the last one we did? 
where we, where we put those two shavings. It was a perfect example. I think it was on the floor. I'm looking to see if they're on the floor. But we were having to plane a piece of holly. No, that's not it. And the shavings, we had to, we had to do it in two passes because it was too wide for one pass. And when you looked at the shaving, it was perfectly square, straight edge on one side and just feathered off to nothing on this side. And then the other piece was the exact opposite, perfect straight edge out here, feathered off to nothing on the inside. And those two feathered off to nothings overlap each other, so when you're done, there is no demarcation, comes out beautiful. And, and that takes a little bit of a knack to getting, to getting right, but it's not difficult. In fact, I'm going to demonstrate it for you. I'm using two stones, my 16,000 on my right, and my, well, Jake's 500 on my left. Now, Jake's a fan of the Shapton lapping plate because he didn't have to pay for it. I did. And I travel with and often use the, sh the uh, trend. It's far less expensive. Not quite as good, but adequate. That's a long story that I hate having to tell because it makes me sound like an idiot when I do. So if I was sharpening my blade in order to produce this edge I'm telling you guys about, I would come in here, referencing off of my, you, you, can you see me? Referencing off of the primary bevel, set that down on the core stone with your 1,000 or 500. Once you're there, with five fingers, distributing the pressure evenly, elevate two or three degrees, and do these little circles. Tight little circles, and you'll notice that my blade is on an angle. It's not like this. If you do it like this, you're going to be going off the blade. So I'm holding it on a bit of an angle. Tight little circles. Now, somebody asked about the pressure. This is about, an, I'm pushing down about hard enough to just start to squeeze a firm grape. If you were here, in which I do with my, when I'm teaching, I'll have people lay their hand on there, and I'll just press down my fingers on the back of their hand so that they can get a good feel for how hard I push. So 10 seconds of this. Count out 10 seconds if you need to. Most people go way too long. As soon as you can detect a slight burr on the back side, you come over here to the 16, you do the same thing, except come up just a little bit higher. When I say a little bit, if I was up three degrees there, I'm going to come up five degrees here, thereabouts. Ten seconds on this one. Now, at the end of ten seconds, without changing anything else, I'm simply going to push a little bit harder with this right index finger. And I would go one, two, three. And then I would switch, and I would push a little bit harder with this left pinky, and I would go one, two, three. The last thing I do is take my steel rule, set it on the edge of the stone, important that it always be in the same spot. Lay the blade down on its back, working within a quarter of an inch of the opposite edge. Spend one, two. Now I've got three fingers distributing the pressure. Three seconds of work like that to eliminate any burr on the back side, and you're good to go. Now, you go, you put it in your blade, in your plane, you try it. If it doesn't work, if you can't get rid of that hard, sharp edge on one side, well, you didn't get it right. You go back and try it again. But I'm, uh, I'm quite impressed and amazed at how, <coughs> excuse me, in our classes, people pick up on that quickly. Good question. Next. All right, just a second. All right, so next one comes from Dela Delaver Singh from Waterloo, Ontario, Canadian. I saw a brief clip of David Charlesworth talking about fitting drawers such, as, such that they tighten two-thirds of the way out to provide a warning that the drawer is almost at its end. Do you have any thoughts on this, and have you ever tried something like that? No, uh, I, I've, I've heard about it. I, I, so, again, David and I are good friends, but we tend to be at odds at a lot of things. But you know what? We can disagree and still like each other. What a novel idea. Take that to heart if it applies. I like uh, Alan Peters' method. The drawer fits as perfectly as possible with no side-to-side -side slop. Now, what I do instead of that is I put a stop on there. So, Jake, can you get over here and see up underneath? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to I'm gonna push this out. So, if you come down here and look up underneath... You'll see a piece of wood. It's got a larger diameter hole with a special screw that has a large washer on the head. 
it's sloped on the front. So it's, it's snug enough that it's not too loose, but it freely moves up and down. So when we put the drawer in there, the bevel allows it to rise up, the drawer goes in, and then it comes falls back down and it prevents it from falling out. That's that method. Uh, this one over here, now actually, do I have an example here, Jake? Mm -mm. I don't think we do. I, th I, I got one right here, I think. Let me give me a second. I'll grab it. Actually, you know what? I can't. It's too big to carry in here. But my other method that I'm going to do here is to have a... Uh, you, can you see? I'm going to cut a round hole. I'm a hole right here, half an, uh, probably three quarters of an inch in diameter, through the divider. I'm going to take a piece of three quarter inch dowel. It doesn't have to be very long. And I'm going to put a washer on the top of it. So the washer is going to be there for two reasons. Number one, it's going to provide a little bit of weight to keep this thing from riding up. Number two, it's going to keep it from falling out. So I've got a piece of... I think I have a piece of three-quarter inch. Yes, I do. So if you can imagine a hole right here with a piece of dowel floating freely, a washer on the top to give it some weight, not a bent washer like that. So when you open your drawer, the washer hits the back and prevents it from coming all the way out. In order to get it out, you just have to go in there with your finger, lift it up, pull your drawer out, and away you go. Bob's your uncle. Or in case Frick's case, it's his father. All right. Have, did we satisfy that one? Yeah. There was a quick question from the chat in here about yep. the last one. If you push too hard when you're playing, can you ruin the? Button? Oh, oh yeah. That was that was oh, some you, that was you, a question. When you push too hard. When yeah. You're so that's why I threw that part in. Uh, I, I'm I'm switching topics, but only to exp explain the point. When I teach dovetails, which we do a lot, the number one cause of problems with accuracy at first is they squeeze the life out of that handle. Now, I know it's beautiful and you want to hold it tight, but forbear, nice, light touch. What's really going on is this. You need to have a lot of control up in through here in these muscles so that you can push that forward, that saw forward on a nice, straight line. Until you develop that discipline up in here, folks subconsciously, I think, compensate by squeezing the life out of this thing out here. And it doesn't allow the saw to do what it'll do. The saw will cut laser straight. With all you, all you gotta do is just push it. If you're squeezing it so tight, it's constantly trying to self-correct and you get somewhat of a wiggly, less than straight line. All right, what's that got to do with this? Well, same thing. You have to develop some muscle training, not strength, but uh, control up in through your arms so that you can go do there. You can lean over that stone. You can move just pivoting from the shoulder. Jake, up here. Pivoting from the shoulder, okay, so that you can maintain those angles. Well, what you lack up in here when you first start, you overcompensate by squeezing the life out of that. So you have to want a nice, relaxed grip. The best example is this. Everybody has shaken hands with someone who tried to be macho man and squeeze your hand. Everybody's also shaken hands with the, uh, the fish. You want a nice, the type of handshake that you, that you would offer if you were meeting, if you're a male and you're being introduced to a female. You're not going to squeeze your hand. You're just going to give a nice, comfortable shake. Think about that when you're holding that blade. You want blood to be able to make it into your fingers. You also want to be able to feel what's going on. You'll actually learn to feel through your fingers, but you can't do that if you're squeezing so tight that there's no blood making it there. And can you uh, ruin your stone? Because that's what they're afraid of, is that you're squeezing so tight, you go to push down in the corner and you dig into your stone. Well, no, you're not going to ruin it. And if I did, if I did dig my stone in, and the, the higher grits tend to be softer, don't worry about getting rid of it. You can just avoid that area if it's that bad. And, t and let it naturally wear away as you continue to use the rest of the stone and constantly flattening in between. It'll eventually go away. So don't worry about it, but just remember, relax, 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 nice, comfortable grip. I spend my whole morning that first day when we're teaching dovetails. Relax, relax, relax. You're looking at all these white knuckles. 
By lunchtime, everybody's got red knuckles and things start to work. It's magical. Next. All right, David Brown from Fort Worth, Texas. Hey, David. Oh, and the last guy from Ontario. I, I couldn't pronounce his name after what you said. That's why I didn't say. Yeah, I don't know if I got it right either. Uh, so David wants to know if a higher angle grind on a plain blade produces a cleaner cut in figured wood while adding a bit more resistance. Would grinding a higher angle on a micro bevel on a powered planer slash joiner produce a nicer finish on figured wood to help prevent tear out? I know the benefits of sharp blades and also carbide cutter heads. Just curious to hear your thoughts. Yeah, that's a, uh, that is an interesting question. Uh, if you look at this, I thought that was actually, I thought that was why these chiclets do a better job, and I was mistaken. I thought when I did the figured out the geometry in this that it was actually attacking the wood at a higher angle. But when I actually figured it out and did some, you know, you don't want me doing math. When I actually figured it out, it was the same angle. So I don't know. It would only stand to reason that it would, but uh, it is a hard push. And people say a little harder. No, it's not a little harder. It's a lot harder. When you're planing with this and the high angle blade is in there, it is a much harder push. Would you say double or maybe triple? Well, in my personal experience, it's about 2.3 times. Can they hear Jake? Yeah, they can. Because he's lying anyway, but they did hear him? Okay. Now, you should point out, you leave the high angle blade in your number six. Well, I, I have lots of planes. Well, I know. But yeah, because it's got, it's it's got, some, extra, it's got some extra weight. But it is a much, much harder push. Someone asked me the other day, why not just use it all the time? It works much better. Because the, what, you get, what you have to expend in order to get that benefit is not worth it to have it there if you don't need it. It is a much harder push. So if you want to try it on your power, on your blame blades, I'd love to hear, I'd love to hear uh, what happens. Now, hold on a second. Rex has got it. Annika would like to know how often do you get a splinter? Your daughter Annika would like to know. <laughs> really? <laughs> Can we move on to the next? Are you going to donate tonight, Annika? I'll tell. How often are you going to donate, Annika, to the Purple Heart Project? And if you do tonight, I'll call you and personally answer that question. Next. All right. Next one comes from Fred from all the way in Devon, England. Fred. Oh, sorry. Nope. Uh, Devin, I had, it's Adam from Devon, UK. Do you have a good hand tool method for cutting a stopped groove? For example, the groove for the bottom panel in a small through yeah. dovetail corner box, other than routing the groove, plugging the ends of a fully plowed groove and using half line dovetails instead. Yeah, that is a, uh, that is a tough one. And it, I actually, when reading through the questions that was asked multiple times. So I thought, well, you know what? We really need to address that. So let's, uh, let's try it, because I had an idea. Uh, I'll tell you some of the things that I have done in the past that didn't necessarily work out extremely well. I'm just going to, I've got a piece of pine here, and I'm going to uh, trim that edge, because lo and behold, there's grooves in there that we were using when we were testing our drawer bottom planes. So, what Devin is say no, um, he's from Devon. Tell me his name, Frick. Adam. Adam. Uh, I'll get a couple of examples here that will show this better. Um, Jake. Yeah, I do. I got one right here. Boxes galore. What is in here? Oh, it's full of money. It weighs a ton. That's where I left it. Yeah. <laughs> what? Okay, so here's an example. We had to, this was, this was done by hand. So we had to cut, in order to, in order to put this bottom in, we had to cut a groove. So being a half blind, we were able to arrange it so that the groove, it's a bad dovetail, the groove on this piece was sitting in between this half pin and this half pin. So you just plowed right on through, no problem. And because it's a half blind, that groove, when we were doing the tailboard, 
we were able to plow right through because you can't see the end of it, so it wasn't an issue. However, in this one, again, we were able to do it on the, on the uh, pin board because we've just simply placed it between the pins. But how do you prevent it from coming out through here on the tailboard? And that was tough. I'll show you what I did. I won't recommend it. So I went in like this. I set my marking gauge. Now when I've got my marking gauge set like this, the cutter, let's, uh, let's put a mark on here on where we need to stop. Twisted piece of wood. So let's say we need to stop here. So I made my groove nice and deep as deep as we could get it and you'll see why now if you wanted to you could switch I'm always looking for selling opportunities but interpret it as this problem solving for you we offer multiple different cutters you see how much larger diameter that one is so in this case I could come in switch cutters Excuse me just one second. Guys, do you want to be introduced or are you going to be? Okay. Yep, very. So I can come in with this much larger diameter cutter and I can get that groove really deep. What I'm doing is I'm establishing a nice clean wall on one side of the groove. Now, this was the hard part. In order to get the other side of the groove, I had to come in here. If I do it with this marking gauge as it's set up, it's going to produce the bevel on the wrong side. And I don't want that. Now, if it's my lucky night, I'll actually find the proper Allen key to change this. There it is. Really tighten that. Okay, so what I'm going to do is take this. Turn it around. So now the bevel's on the outside. And if you've ever done this, you're instantly going to be fighting it the whole time because the bevel causes that to want to go in that direction. Uh, the bevel, ca uh, I don't know, let me explain this. See where the bevel is? When you drag that through the wood, the bevel causes the the cutter to want to go that way, pulling the head of the tool tight to the edge. That's how you're able to always get it right. Turn it around. Now the bevel is going to want to make it come this way and be constantly pulling away. So you have to be extremely careful. I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm, I'm literally trying this idea live. I've, I've, I've tried it freehand, and it was extremely difficult to do because a lot of the times what we would be doing is uh, literally cutting it with a chisel. Okay, so what I want to do is I want to take my, my quarter-inch rotor plane cutter. I'm going to put my headgear on. You older guys, like me, get yourselves a pair of these optivisors. I couldn't do half of what I do without them. So I'm going to set this on here and see if I can't line this up so that it perfectly matches where that cutter would be. In other words, exactly, that looks like I got it right there. Lock that down. Now, I have to be extremely careful because as I mentioned, this is gonna wanna constantly be pulling. In fact, I think what I'll do is put it in the vise so that I can push nice and hard.
I haven't heard any other vets' names. Rex is making a list for me, and then we're going to kind of read a few at a time instead of just shouting them out randomly. All right. I'm pushing really hard against this to keep that thing from doing as I told you. If you allow it, it'll veer off, and then you're cutting down into the part of your board that you're going to keep. I'm making several passes to gradually take it deeper. Now, when we were doing these, and everybody in the class was doing it, there was so much work to doing this that by the time they were done, the thing was beat to snot. It looked like it sat out on the middle of a freeway for an afternoon. So you have to be really careful. So far, so good. I'm going to try turning this one around and see if I can get as good a results. It's just going to make that even deeper and give me a nice clean cut ball. But then we got to clean out the material in between. How are our donations tonight, Frick? I don't, I'm not keeping track of that, sorry. What are you doing? I'm monitoring the live feed oh, okay. and asking the questions. Remember how hard these guys or what these guys put in. Just so you know, we've shattered our record of viewers. Yeah, what are we at? Uh, 761. That's shattered? We've barely made it over 7. I think 725 was the previous. That's shattering to me. No, that's great. So let's make this a record night for donations. I'm going to stop right there for a second. Oh, sh I, I want to introduce you to my backboard. And and I uh, we had somebody recently yap at me because I talk about the Purple Heart Project too much on our YouTube videos. Tough. And they left. This is why we with do it. Probably with their tail between their legs as well. Oh, I think they did. So I want to introduce you to two guys. You already met the colonel, and right beside him is Super Dave Benson. Dave is a combat wounded vet, 17 Look years. How handsome he is. He's just stunning. Now I know why Michelle married him. I think. <laughs> Dave, 17, 17 years, half it in the Navy, half it in the Army. Dave uh, was the unfortunate recipient of some RPG shrapnel in the side of his head, which to this day, the other day he had a migraine. He said it was so bad. What did he say? Thought he was going to die. Thought he was going to die. Two days in, was it two days in bed? Yeah. I think second day might have been the just. The second one was just no thinner. The sad, the, the, Dave tells an interesting story that when he, when he was medically discharged, and he'd always enjoyed woodworking. And his father, his father had, or grandfather had left him an old craftsman saw. But there was something about it that the, as soon as he turned it on, the frequency of that saw just gave him a debilitating migraine and he could not use it. And he was really bummed. I'm going to tell you the rest of the story. So uh, he somehow migrated into hand tools. So he went out and he bought this old cobalt, not old, a cobalt plane. Such a brand name. Piece of garbage. Anyway. And somehow he went, on, he went on YouTube to find out how to work it, and he ended up finding me, and I, my, I published my number. I answered the phone. So he called me, and uh, I said to him, I don't remember this conversation, but he does. He was asking me about how to, what to do with it and whatever, and I said, well, Dave, have you, got a, have you got a garbage can nearby? Yeah, he says, okay. He said, I said, walk over there and drop it in there. He said, it's junk. It's not worth your time. It'll only frustrate you. But knowing he was a combat wounded vet, I said, what you need to do is apply to our program and come. Well, Dave got accepted. And he came, and as a result of some other things that are too long to get into, Dave is now part of our team. In fact, Dave takes care of the combat wounded vets, the selection process, the vetting, all of that for uh, the uh, classes in uh, August, September, and October. Luther does May, June, July. Dave does the last three. So that's on this side. Is Jeremy? Jeremy brought this? Canadian vet named Jeremy recently dropped by. He said he saw the American flag, which was, which was made by Mark Wachowski, and all the guys in the class signed it on the back. So he made us a Canadian one, which I think is awesome. 
And up here we have Philip Gustafson, who was in my very first class, combat wounded vet, Marine. No, Army. He was Army because he gave me the green hat. And uh, perfect dovetail. Over there we have Marshall Rommel. Same class. Same class, yep. Uh, Marshall was a uh, mar uh, Marine. Pretty sure Marshall's Marine. Correct me if I'm wrong, Marshall. Another incredible dovetail. Over here is Jesse Paredes. And I'm going to stop later in the show, and I'm going to tell you, because somebody asked, how did this whole thing start? Can, you, can you just slide that thing, that frame a bit? Well, Jesse's a little off-center, isn't he? Right below, we had a, uh, a fellow in our uh, class who was Special Forces, and to commemorate, or he, he gave me this, and we made this frame for it, and just that was a Canadian-American joint venture and started in 1942, in World War II. Here are my challenge coins, the story behind every one of them, and uh, this is why we do this program. We owe these people, you and me, not the government, not some corporation, but you and me. They did this for us. It's our responsibility to give back. And if we can only help a handful of them, that's a handful that get helped. And I, I want to really tip my hat to Jack Lane and all the people who have, who have uh, taken it upon themselves to uh, make this bench brigade work. It is, you couldn't I can't believe, I, I, I suspected it, but uh, my suspicions have come true. How many of these guys have gone home, left our program, and haven't touched woodworking since? Because they have nowhere to do it. They don't have a bench. You've got to have a bench. And it's a daunting task to build a bench. And we called them up. These are guys from the past, and they were thrilled. And when Jack tells the story, he says, Robbie says, every time I talk to one of these guys, I know why I'm doing this. And it's awesome. Absolutely awesome. Be a part of it, and it'll bless your life. Okay. So make a donation. Be a rest assured. I give you my word that that money comes in, and it gets used for either their meals, their airfare, their hotel, or their tools. The only thing that we spend that money on that isn't directly related is I, we pay Super Dave's uh, airfare and feed him and hotel him here, and we do the same thing with Luther and anybody else that we bring in as an assistant. But uh, nobody's getting a wage off of this. This is what we do because we know how important it is. All right, you heard that. You're going to hear some more. All right, so now what I've got, I've got two good, what's going on out there in... Internet land. Any questions? I expect you just to speak up, right? If you if yep. something happens. Luther's got taken care of most of them. Okay. But if somebody wants to talk about this, I need to know what's going on too. I want to hear what's being said in case I need to fill on something. Okay. So now what i got to do is i got to get rid of that material. So what I used to do, I would come in with a, uh, a quarter-inch chisel. Now you got to know where to stop. So, And this is a pain. Let me tell you, doing these stop datos by hand is a pain. And did I get that a quarter of an inch? No, I didn't. I'm a little too narrow. So I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna do the easy one. I'll switch this back. By the way, if you have if you don't have two marking gauges or four or six, you're behind the eight ball. It it really pays. These things are so versatile. They act as a uh, as a router plane, a marking gauge. Cutting gauge, depth gauge. Depth gauge. I use them if I need a uh, if I need a strip of masking tape, a certain size. I'll go in there and I'll take my marking gauge like this. I'll set it for whatever I want and I'll go in and just make a cut like that and go all the way around if I have to, and then you end up with that perfect size tape so really versatile tool so now i gotta go in i gotta make this just a little bit wider i'm gonna do the easy one let's see if that's the right size take my quarter inch chisel could go even bigger i should have went all the way down i didn't This gives me a nice deep line. And you want to keep you want to make sure that is firmly locked. I'm 
Okay. Is Charlie on tonight? Charlie Ray, have you seen him? Nope. Now, what I would have done is come in here like this and just slowly removed the bulk of that material between those cuts. But it was so easy to accidentally bump the other line. Now what I had done too is I would go in and I would clamp a piece on there like that and use that as a guide. Either way, it was a long, arduous process. So what I thought about when I read that question earlier today is what if we went in, put the quarter inch cutter in here and then clamped a fence on here? So I'm gonna try that and see. Now Lee Nelson makes this particular, uh, shoot Jake, where's my, where's my driver? You see it There's around? There's one right there. Huh? There's one just below the bench, bench rabbit. Just below the bench rabbit plane. This? Just below in the drawer. This, oh. Jeez, attitude. No. Well, that'll work, but that's not the one I want. Mm. Now, I don't use this a whole lot, and I'm not referring to the, I'm not referring to this tool. I'm referring to what I'm about to show you. It's the adapter for using the smaller cutters in this large router plane. But I gotta get that all the way out. And you take that, and where's my quarter inch cutter? Didn't I just have it? No. Put that in there, like so. Got to bring that all the way up. Yeah. Somebody wants to know why you don't use the mortise gauge attachment. Describe the lines for the groove. Because the mortise gauge attachments I use more for the tenon. The mortise gauge attachments that I don't have here, the cutters are on the outside. So that would leave your bevel on the outside instead of the bevel on the inside. When I cut a mortise, I, I, when I actually cut the mortise, I usually only I use my marking gauge, and I just have one line instead of two like this. But when I cut my tenon, you need two lines. And so I designed my marking gauge, my mortising gauge, to put the bevel on the outside so it leaves you that perfect shape for your tenon. Hopefully that makes sense. So it's, to clear things up for that, it's... <coughs> it's for marking the tenon, but it is the dimension of the mortise. Yes, because you've referenced it off of your chisel. That's a, that's a separate question. Okay, we got this in place. Now, I'm going to, uh, this is going to take multiple passes. I'll see if I can take a cut that heavy first. I'll lock this in place. Now, in order to do this, we'd have to have a fence on there. I, I added this piece on, so I frequently will use this tool for cutting down the tenon. So you're holding it over here, and you're going in, and you're working away on that tenon. But if you didn't have this, you don't have as much material because as you're, when you're doing this, that cutter is pulling, pulling the, uh, the tool down like this. So you got to have a lot of reference surface here to counteract that. Trust me, I do it a lot. Now I'm going to get a couple of clamps. Now, if I'm a little bit... Uh, do you need a fence? Huh? Do you need I'm going to use that piece of poplar right there. I was I was looking for some smaller clamps, but I don't see them. Can Those you small use a C piece clamps. Of holly? No, I'm not using a piece of holly. As a fence? Would we use a piece of vera wood? And look it's Dave in the face? It would, it would be well lubricated. So I've got that sitting right between them. We'll just make this nice and smooth.
You realize we're not done half of the first page, right? This might be a great idea for uh, once a month. Of course it's a great idea because it's mine. Oh, you know what? We probably shouldn't do this. <laughs> was, it your, was it your idea, Frank? Yes, really? it was. Yes. Absolutely. You're not just saying that. No, to 100%. In fairness to Frick, Are you using his best anything? idea ever was marrying my daughter. True. His Until I realized the uh, baggage <laughs> that came with. You just haven't uh, completed the dowry. <laughs> uh, but Frick's actually come up with some great ideas. Our YouTube channel was Frick's original idea. Uh, this whole live thing was Frick's idea. Keep going. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm hitting a wall, Frick. Help me. Yeah. I don't know either. So I got I got lots of fence. Now let's see how we. It would be nice if the grain was running the right way. Now, I may have had too aggressive of a cut. But you know what? This is going to work a whole lot better than the way we did used you, to do it. Did you chop down at the end? Yeah. Oh no, I didn't. Thank you, Jake. I thought I did. That's what the intent was. So I've got to make sure that this stops where I need it to stop. So. This is actually taking care of several uh, of the questions because I saw this came up m multiple times. Are you removing that right now so you can take the cut deeper? Yeah. Yeah, I want to hit that wall. I don't want to risk, because of the amount of force required to push that router plane, I don't want to risk blowing off the end of this. Uh, when, are we, when is Ash coming on? Whenever. Is he standing by? Yep. After you're done this question. We're okay. almost at 800 viewers, too, so it's a good time. Well, those are some pretty good numbers. Turn off that board. Hi. Nope, 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 nope. What? Thank you. Now, I, I, I'll, I'm going to tell you something right now. It's nice to have this big piece to reference off of, but I've got this, uh, I've got this cutter just a little bit too low. I'm going to bring that up. And I use a screwdriver on this. I don't think you can get it tight enough just with thumb pressure unless you're Super Dave. And that's only because he spends most of his day twiddling his thumbs. That's not true. He feeds the chickens. He does? I thought his wife did that. We had them all marching in line the other day. And... Social distancing. <laughs> now, you may be thinking we're giving Super Dave a hard time, but he actually calls and asks for this. If, if I thought the grain was going the wrong direction, I could easily turn this around and go the other way. It might be a little bit tough at the end. You'd have to definitely do some chisel work. Now, for the sake of uh, seeing it work, I'm going to take this down a little bit to prove to you whether or not it does work. So I'm going to go with a, I'm going to advance that a fair bit. I think it's important in the beginning that you make shallow cuts to get that little trough established because once you've established the trough, then it rubs on the sides of the cutter and it will go a long way to helping keep that cutter from drifting off one side or the other. I'll make, uh, I'll make one more pass. 
Any feedback on this technique? Anybody saying anything? Sorry, I was looking at my phone to set up ash here. I wasn't. Now, this is the neatest that I have seen in uh, attempting to do this over the years. I'm going to go in here and I'm just going to trim that wall. Is my brother Randy on? Rex? You're cleaning that out with your chisel. Couldn't you run the router plane? I could. I just I made it a little bit too wide. <laughs> but because it's got some depth, I can run the side of the chisel, the wall, the side of the chisel along that wall, and it's keeping it in line. I think they're out celebrating with their stimulus check. up that. This inside wall was nice and clean to begin with, so I don't have any work to do there. So what I'm going to do is have Jake come in with the camera. Now this is in poplar. Poplar tends to be somewhat of a stringy wood, but remember this is down inside a groove, so it's not like you're going to be seeing it. You're going to put a panel in there. but I'm quite impressed with the results. Take a quick look at that. Now, that, that would be stopped here and stopped over here, so the only difficulty you would have is you'd have to dig, you'd have to start it here and then maybe turn it around in order to finish this end like you finished that one. Good question, and I'm, I'm, I'm happy with the answer. Okay, Ash, or Rex, I have a 45, and uh, no, I've never used it. Somebody else asked that question, too. I, I think that was mostly for softwood. I can't imagine using that very easily in maple. And if could I ever explain, get some time. Could you explain what? Oh, what it, so a Stanley 45-55 were uh, planes that would cut various profiles. Kind of a funky-looking thing. I don't even know where mine is. I don't think it's right here within uh, reaching distance. Because I don't. Hey, Ash is on. Uh, I don't know where it is. Anyway, no, I haven't, but I plan to at some point. Okay, so Ash Wilk came uh, came to our attention because of Tony, right? Tony Martin, who was there in the class with us when we very first, the very early beginnings of uh, Purple Heart, and Tony was uh, helped us out in a big way. And he's been a huge advocate for the Purple Heart Project down under. And he put us in touch with Ash. And because Ash was coming from so far away, Australia, we brought him in. And he wanted to do something like this back home. We brought him in two or three or four days early to, so he could kind of acclimate. And he actually ended up teaching with us a little bit before he took the class. And uh, it was just awesome having him. So he's grown a lot of facial hair since... since Facial hair since I last saw him. He's, he's more attractive now, too. <laughs> yeah, more. <laughs> Jake thinks you can start it from your eyebrows and run it all the way down. Ash, go ahead. Uh, what I want you to do is just tell them what the Purple Heart Project uh, did for you from the perspective of a combat wounded vet. Tell them where you are and what time it is and the rest of that stuff. Uh, Wait a minute. Ho, 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 ho. Ho, ho, Ash. Do we need Dave to translate? Say that again. We're just checking the volume. Yeah, you'll need to get Dave one of those free ski things, but not. Free. <laughs> Sorry, you asked. Can it just, we need to check. Somebody tell us if you can hear him. 
Is Super Dave on? Can't hear Ash. Ash is pretty quiet. Anyway, you can speak up, Ash, or get closer to your mic. Uh, hello. <laughs> yeah, they'll have to turn up their uh, they'll have to turn up their volume, I guess. Where are you? In terms of your, where's your backyard? Um, Conjola, uh, South Coast, New South Wales, Australia. Um, we're one of the lucky ones that didn't burn down in New Year's Eve. So, yeah. You got evacuated, didn't you? Still here. Uh, no, actually, I, well, my family evacuated and then I got stuck in the fire because um, it came through so quick. Um, yeah. Okay. Address, address, address your experience with the Purple Heart. Um, mate, it was fantastic. I, um, I, so, as you alluded to before, I, I, I'm a woodworker. I, before uh, doing Purple Art Project. Um, and I'd been doing a thing called Dovetails for Diggers where um, I get uh, veterans around and they make a dovetail box to put their medals in. And um, coming to your project actually showed me how uh, bad of a job I was doing. <laughs> So, yeah, it was, and it gave me the confidence to really, um, to really try and excel at, at what I'm doing here. And, um, yeah, it was, yeah, just uh, life-changing, to be honest. It was just, to, and to, to hang out with some guys, um, you know, that are, sort of been through the ringer and to sort of see see it from the side of a student is um, yeah it was lovely and you know and the compassion that you have Rob yourself was it was lovely to be around it was yeah just the, the whole environment um, uh, it's just outstanding and that was just super Dave no it was mostly Jake mate um, <laughs> super Dave was just annoying yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know what we, we had a blast we that was uh, that was one of the more fun weeks that we've ever experienced it was just Constant laughs. It was a ton of fun. You should explain Dave's yeah. uh, Dave's translation. And, and uh, Bob, how funny was that guy? Bob Abbott. Bobbert. Yeah. Jeez. I, mate, I felt like I'd done a, a billion sit-ups every day after hanging out with him after so many belly laughs. And... Uh, yeah, and Dave and he's snoring in bed next to me. I'll never <laughs> forget that. That was only when you cuddled, though, right? <laughs> well, yeah, he he he'd jump into my bed every so, every <laughs> now and again and spoon because it was cold. <laughs> Ash, on a more serious note, I want you to address uh, combat wounded vets that may be watching and are uh, gun shy about applying. say from experience the hardest thing is just biting the bullet but as soon as you bite the bullet and you you get on your way you'll never look back um, you know when I was on my way to the airport I uh, I said to myself, 
you know, at least a dozen times, nah, it can't be this. No, nah, it can't be this. Because I'd, I'd never been, I hadn't been on a plane for years and, and in public like that for years. Um, and so flying, flying all the way to Canada from here was, um, it was incredibly daunting. But as, as soon as I got on the plane and got comfortable, um, I knew it was going to be the best thing I'd ever done. And it really was. But it, 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 is, it is really hard. And, um, you know, for the guys that are a bit gun shy, you know, it, it, it will be hard to actually make yourself go. But trust me, once you get there, you'll never, ever look back. Not even for a second. It'll be the best thing you'll ever do. Could you uh, educate us and just tell us a little bit about the significance of this day for Aussies? Um, Anzac Day is uh, our war commemoration day. So um, we we commemorate uh, uh, the. Uh, landing at Gallipoli, so uh, a particular battle in, in World War One that was quite heavy uh, on Australian and New Zealanders. Um, uh, Gallipoli is in Turkey. Um, it was basically just a big, a big stuff up. <laughs> we went, landed on the wrong beach, and, and just got absolutely smoked. Yeah, so it's it's it started, you know, obviously um, purely as a commemoration day for that, but yeah, now it's um, you know, our our biggest day uh, to commemorate everybody who uh, sacrificed. So yeah, we have all the well when it when there's no virus going around. We have all our marches and and all that sort of stuff. But um, Anzac Day this year was uh, we just hung out in our driveway with the family and lit a candle and um, listened to the bugle and had a minute silence as the sun came up in the morning, which um, it was really lovely in a different way. Sort of, you know, it just sort of, yeah. In closing, Ash, can you just uh, say whatever you want to say to the multiple people that donate that make it possible for us to do this? Thank you. <laughs> That's all it needs. Yeah. Yeah. I'd cuddle every one of you if I could. Even Dave. Oh. Yeah, <laughs> Dave's had his fair share of cuddles. Yes, thank you. It's been awesome. Good to see you. Good to talk to you again. Yeah, mate, it's been ages. I know, I know. I got to come good on that promise I made you. Are you ready for it? Tools? Yeah, I've got to, yeah, I've got to build a new shed. Because that, uh, yeah, I don't have a workplace anymore, but I've got to get a new shed, so. So, so what, so what, Ash? What Ash is doing, he's trying to put together a program where local vets can come over and he can share with them. So I told him, I said, look, I'll, I'll give you a tool, so, uh, three sets of tools so that you can do this right. But uh, he needs to uh, now build a, a shed of some sort in order to be able to do it. So keep me posted on that. You never know. You might see some generous donors kick in for some building materials. It wouldn't be, it wouldn't be unlike them. Uh, yeah, the shed didn't didn't survive the fire, so that'll um, that'll come. Yeah, it's just the way it goes. Well, it'd be nice to have a little help too. We'll see what we can do about that. Oh yeah, of course, yeah, absolutely, it'd be lovely. But 
same feeling Rob just sort of you know seeing guys at the start of the week you know there's not much conversation and you know guys are a bit tentative and then by the end of the week you can't get people to shut up to you know give them some teaching points because they're just chin wagging and having such a good time and it's yeah it's just beautiful to see and, and it's beautiful to be able to be a part of it yeah i can't see your chin wagon <laughs> it's under there yeah that, that, yeah it is <laughs> listen we got to get back to this thank you for doing this ash appreciate it no worries rob love you mate yeah you too give the best give our best to your family yeah we'll do buddy Come all right here. we'll be in touch thank you have you, uh, I'm sure you've all experienced something like that where you flood, get flooded with all those memories of something. The week that we had him it was just incredible because every time he would talk, <laughs> Super Dave would stand there and he would give the American translation of what was just said. Had a lot to do with dingoes and uh, armadillos. armadillos. <laughs> I wish we had Dave on here right now because, oh, like I said, it felt like you just did 500 sit-ups at the end of the day because you laughed so much. Awesome. It was awesome. Go ahead. The next question, Frick. How are donations coming? Don't forget. Now, this would be odd. Wouldn't this be incredible? I got to tell you the rest of a little bit of the backstory. Ash was getting a lot of flack because, I mean, he's living on a military pension unable to work because of PTSD, and he's using the money they need for trying to put together this shed so he can bring these guys in. And I know he was getting a little bit of flack from his better half because, you know, he was trying to do things with uh, limited funds and then to have it burned down. Wouldn't it be incredible if we could donate the material, the money for the material so he could get a couple of these vets in and they could build a proper shed? We'll take care of sending them tools. I told him, I will send you enough tools for three guys He's already got his that we sent him with, so you can actually have them. And Because the shed was only big enough, he said, maximum three at a time. So if you want to do something like that, earmark that specifically for helping Ash with that, and we will make sure that it'll happen. Rex? People, on the chat, loud? On the chat, people are saying that we should do a GoFundMe for Ash for some way that they mm, can help. No. No. no don't, don't do GoFundMe. They take 8%. Read the fine print. Do it through us. Just tell us what you want, where that you want it earmarked for that, and we'll make sure. That's why we that's why we started it because eight percent is a big chunk. Don't do it through YouTube. They take thirty two percent. Crazy. Okay, Frick. Okay. We got a long we got a long way to go here. We're only a half an hour left. Can you hurry? Okay. A um, couple plain questions. How how do you fix a crack on the side of a Stanley number seven if it breaks off other than loose? Uh, I, I'll, I'll, so if it isn't cracked, you don't want to fix it. The minute you try to weld something like that, you're going to distort it. Personally, the old Stanley planes weren't built to very tight tolerances. There's no way they're going to be flat. Your ability to flatten something much beyond the length of a, jo uh, a jack plane is pretty slim to none, if you think about it i got to move my gnome. If you're trying to flatten a number seven and you're applying pressure here and here, look how far away your pressure is from the end of the plane. I wouldn't even attempt it. For the amount of effort that you're going to put in to try to do that, go buy a Wood River. If you got the money, go buy a Lee Nelson. Buy a good plane and just get to enjoy it. It's, it's just... I've, I, have rec I have restored... Mo more than 300, possibly as many as 400 planes, and I'm telling you, even when it's done and finished, they don't work anywhere near like one of these do. They don't have the mass. And now, just to end this, so we took a couple of number five and a half. We took a five and a half Wood River and a five and a half uh, Stanley, and we weighed them. Jake, how much did the Wood River? How much did the Stanley weigh? Four pounds, 
12 ounces. And how much was the, the uh, Wood River? Seven pounds, two ounces. Huge difference. Now, you think that, that doesn't make a difference? That mass, when you're pushing it through a piece of hardwood, is all the difference in the world. And it just, this, it's just so solid in your hands. I don't sell Wood River planes in the U.S., and most of the people watching tonight are from the U.S., so I'm not trying to sell you a plane. I'm trying to give you a great experience. If you're in Canada or any of the rest of the world, I can help you out. The only thing we don't do is we cannot sell Wood River planes into the U.S. by agreement with Woodcraft. Frick, next. Okay, so that, that, one, that one was from Matt from Chicago. We have another. Hey, Matt. That one, the next one's from Dusty, also from Chicago. I'm considering purchasing a scraper plane. What have you... What has been your experience and the pros and cons? Thank you. Well, if you're going to get a scraper plane, there's there's a third one. It's a small one. I don't bother with it. There's two. Uh, this is the, is patterned after the Stanley number. I used to know this stuff off by heart. 85. And the nice thing about this is the blade goes all the way to both sides. So if you need to get into a vertical surface, you can do that. By the way, the handles tilt so you don't bust your knuckles. You don't have as wide a path, but that is a nice feature. This one, which is patterned after the Stanley 112, the blade doesn't go all the way, but it's a heavy plane and it's a much wider cut. Uh, I'd be hard pressed to make, uh, it's almost a 50-50. Uh, if I was going to do one or the other, one of the nice things about this is that you can, you can advance, the move the blade, tilt it forward, which actually is like, advancing the blade on a plane as you tilt it forward because the cutting edge is behind or ahead of the pivot point it actually puts that blade down deeper for a heavier cut so i probably would do 51 percent 49 and there's a knack to doing it now most people think that you got to use something like this for planing bird's eye maple no a sharp hand plane a sharp hand plane will always trump a scraper unless you move into the exotics. And then in those cases, these are work extremely well. So if you're not working with exotics, I would say you need to revisit your hand plane experience. Make sure that you're, you've got your sharpening down. Make sure you get good sharpening gear. We sell, the stuff that we sell is the stuff that we use. We're not, we don't promote stuff unless we actually use it ourselves. So our sharpening gear, I consider to be the best. If there was something better, I'd go find it. And when I say best, I mean number one criteria for sharpening gear, and this applies to scrapers as well because you have to be sharpened likewise. My number one criteria is the end result. What kind of an edge are you going to get from it? My number two criteria, let's get the fingers right, is the speed. If it takes me a half an hour, I'm not interested. If it takes me less than a minute, I'm highly interested. Number three criteria is the cost, and that's way over here. I don't care what it costs. This stuff is what makes all my tools work. I don't care what it costs if I'm getting performance at the top and speed at the top. Those two should be the only thing you worry about. Yeah, I know. You're going to go on to me about money, money, money. There's tons of money out there. Money is a reward for service rendered. If you don't have enough money, look in the mirror and say, have I rendered enough service? And if you don't and you haven't, change it, fix it. That's my speech on money. Next. Okay. Up next is from Scott McKee. He's from Cumberland, British Columbia. Hey, Scott, O Canada. And he wants to know, I'm interested in your take on leveling an applied wooden edging to a piece of hardwood veneered plywood. The face veneers on the plywood are very thin and easy to go through when leveling the edging. Shoot, I was going to, I was going to, I read that one and I was going to set up for it and I didn't get to it. I forgot. Um, so the problem is if you're banding, it's typically what we call it, a, uh, well, here, come over here, Jake, please. So here's what we did. This is a piece of maple um, uh, MDF core plywood. And we, well, I had a beautiful piece of bird's eye. You can see how heavy the bird's eye is. And I wanted to utilize that as much as possible. So I was able to get this piece and this piece and that piece and that piece, that one all the way down out of one piece. So when you glue that on, then you have to flush it up. I, uh, the better you get... And that's really not better. It's, I should say, the more confident you get. The, uh, if this is 3 quarter, then at the most, this is going to be 13 sixteenths applied. And then you've got to come in, and you're always going to have to flush it up. 
the easiest way, and I don't do it by power, I do it by hand. The easiest way to do it is to lay your plane, and I typically will use my five and a half. Lay your plane so that you've got lots of reference surface over here. You want this to come down to that. So you don't want to be working the other way around where you're trying, you know, you need to have that reference point. And I always plane so that I can see down through my throat. I can see where the blade is and I'm getting really close. And I'm constantly stopping and feeling with my thumb or finger so I know when I'm really close. And then I'll adjust accordingly, meaning I'll pull the blade in so I have very little exposure. So little that if I accidentally hit the veneer, I'm not doing any damage. I'm just barely touching it. Now, you may want, instead of using a five and a half, you may want to use your block plane. Maybe some people find it a little easier to control. has nothing to do with the cutting angle, but you just might want to use that to get that final cut. The blade needs to be incredibly sharp so that you're not tearing anything. You don't have to worry about tearing the veneer if you have the blade really sharp with minimal projection. Close that throat down. I don't think I've ever, and I've done a lot of this, I don't think I've ever ruined the piece of veneer when doing that banding. Now, how do you get there? Well, it starts right here. You've got to have sharpening gear. And if you're not willing to spend your money on sharpening gear, then you're not serious about any of this. This, and I'm harping on it, this makes all those tools work. So if you scrimp over here, you're going to pay for it every time you pick up that plane that chisel, any of those planes, don't scrimp. Buy the best that there is. Save your money until you can afford it. You will thank me. I, our attitude here is do the cry once choice. Cry when you buy it, and you smile every time afterwards. If you don't spend enough and you get the junk, you're going to cry every time you use it. There is no end to the pain. Okay, oh, hopefully that was answered. Next. I want to, bef before I read the next question, I think we should give a special shout-out to... Uh, Douglas Dolter, he just donated two thousand dollars. Mattress Doug. Just donated two thousand dollars to the. Purple you know Hotel. what? This is Doug, is just a great guy. Let me tell you a little backstory. Doug has a mattress factory, and uh, not not the mattress factory. That's a, that's an actual. Oh no, Matt, D Doug has a has a has a he ma and he manufactures mattresses, and uh, his shop was closed down because of this coronavirus. So he turned all of his sewing machines and his staff and his supplies into making masks that he freely gives out to first responders. That's the kind of person Doug is. I'm not the least bit surprised to see him doing that. He and a friend are coming up, what class? October. October, coming to take our October class. I can't wait to shake his hand. Super person, and he's the type of people that we love to surround ourselves with. Doug, thank you. Um, You're, you'll be mattress Doug forever, by the way. Speaking of people, do we have that list of vets? Yeah, I'm sure we have more than three, but three that made their presence. So Danny Bell's here, of course. Uh, Hardwood Grove. Sean McDermott. Danny, Danny Bell. Danny Bell. Danny Bell. Sean McDermott And Stinker and the here. girls. That's just who we know them as. Howdy. And, and Danny. Uh, Dan, uh, Felix. Uh, huh? Felix. Uh, Felix. Oh, yes. Yes. Super Dave said special hi to Felix. He wanted Felix to come up and spend a weekend, play with the chickens. Um, Dan, I, uh, I talked to Scott the other day about getting him a bench. So if you haven't already, we're going to put you two together. So i got to tell you a little bit about Danny Bell. Danny was a helicopter pilot that flew the Chinook helicopters. That's the big one that has two props. And um, Danny is a combat wounded vet. Came here and took our class and just, a, just salt of the earth. So Luther, no, Super Dave and Jake and I, Went down to, um, oh, oh, I left, I'm, where did I the move? The Hardwood it? Grove. The Hardwood Grove, which is in Clarksville, Tennessee. And Danny said, uh, Rob, I really want to help promote this project. And he had 32 combat wounded vets show up on Saturday. He went out, found a local barbecue establishment, which was fantastic food, provided all the food for us for the day, and we spent a day demonstrating um, hand planning and sharpening and dovetails. It was fantastic. And I told Danny, we will come every year. If you're going to put this kind of effort in, the least we can do is do our part. So we we'll, we will down and we'll be back. And uh, Stinker gave up his bed for me. Appreciate it. And 
And the rest of it is just great memories. Who else? Uh, Sean McDermott and David. Sean. Deshaun. Sean was another story. If I if I go through this, I'm not going to get any more done. But Sean is Sean was a memorable experience. I will tell that story someday about me standing in a grocery store and when Sean called. Sean's going to come back and be one of our uh, um, assistants. Which class do we have him in? Can't remember. But Sean and Sean's wife is a uh, is a nurse, so she's working through this coronavirus. So uh, we tip our hat to her. Fantastic people. And uh, Dave Duchamp. Dave. Dave actually wasn't a combat wounded vet. Dave was uh, in the class, but Dave has been a staunch supporter. You just, uh, Dave, Force. you're awesome. You're absolutely awesome. Air Pardon? Force. Air Force? Oh, yes. I wasn't a combat wounded vet, but he was a vet. He, he was is. in the Air Force. But uh, I, Dave, Dave donates every time. Much appreciated. Anyone else? Well, I'm sure there is, but Rex only had the three. All right, let's move on, yep. shall we? Uh, Jason from Northern California. By the way, if we do this again, Derek's if you here. keep your questions short, they're more likely to get answered. Some of them were... Ooh, Derek's on. Derek is? Our Derek? Derek, welcome. Uh, I assume Charlie's somewhere close by. What, Frick? Okay, Jason from Northern California. Hi, Jason. When setting up a small shop, what are the first tools I should acquire? Power or hand tools, thinking about making small boxes. What ah, okay. I'm going to have to separate that. We'll do it if we're going to do hand tools, and we'll do it with power. If you're going to do power, remember, well, I, don't don't, get, I don't why, get what, what? Why don't you tell him what you would buy for both? That's what I'm going to do. Well, I know. But you when you're making you're small boxes, it. right? He's thinking about making small boxes, so maybe focus on But that. he said power or hand, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you both. No budget. Uh, I don't get I don't get sponsored by any of these companies that I'm mentioning. If I'm selling something, I'll tell you because I'll tell you where to buy it. Here, buy a saw stop. I don't care what it costs. Buy a saw stop. It's not worth it. Somebody recently, a customer recently, sent me a picture of a friend of his, and the table saw went right up through the middle of his index finger. There was no warning, and I saw that. It's like oh, and it was terrible. And if you think a saw stop's expensive, think twice about that. So get yourself a saw stop. Table saw is the heart of your shop. When we built this, I wanted to be able to tr drive a truck around my saw, and today we actually can. This is the. Uh, this will do more than any other power tool you have. This would be number one. Number two is going to be a jointer, and don't get anything less than an eight-inch jointer because you'll just find that it's not enough. I've got a 16, and I can count on one hand the number of times in a year that we need that 16-inch capacity. So. I bought it because I had it. Or I, I had an opportunity to. An 8-inch jointer, and it's got to be a good one. Don't have time to get into all that. I wouldn't buy anything less than a Delta Rockwell 8-inch jointer. Ah, actually that one. Um, second tool that I would buy Drill press? is probably going to be, uh, oh, you know what, that's a tough one. I'm going to tell you that number three has tied. A drill press, you need a drill press, and a bandsaw. And you want at least a 15-inch, something with a little bit of beef. And I would stop there. Now, some people say about thickness planer. Well, you know what? If you're doing small boxes, you can actually rip it on the table saw and then finish it with the hand plane. Now, hand tools, of course, right here. You have to start right here. This is where you have to spend your money, right here. Buy your sharpening gear that I tell you to buy. And if you're not sure, call me and ask me, and I'll tell you. The minimalist kit is going to be a trend diamond plate and a 16,000 grit Shapton stone, and that will give you a fantastic edge. If you want to go all out, then you're going to get the Shapton lapping plate. Costs money, but it has a level of precision you can't get anywhere else. And if you're going to do that route, then you have to have the Shapton 1,000 or 500 and the 16,000. As far as planes go, the 5.5 Wood River is going to be the plane that you will use most of the time. I, would, I don't think I'd be exaggerating if I said... I use that 85% of the time that I'm using hand plane. What? Can we, s th there have been a lot of people that have asked, they have a number six. Six. Do they need to go get a five and a half? No, no. You see the difference? There's the five and a half and there's the six right beside it. So all of the parts, all of the parts, with the exception of the actual body of the plane, are identical. The uh, difference, where, wh who's that? That's not mine. The difference is, uh, looks to be about two and three quarters of an inch. That's the only difference. 
We give the vets a six because it's a little closer to a jointer, which mean, and it's going to be a little easier to, trans, tra, to uh, uh, transport back home. And we give them a four and a half. But you asked a question, if you're just going out and buying it yourself, I would buy a five and a half, number one. Number two would be my low angle block plane. Stay away from the standard angle. You want the low angle. The Wood River is the best, I think, the best value. My third plane would be a three-quarter inch shoulder plane. Blade goes all the way to both sides. That will do tasks that no other plane can do. And if I was going to get a fourth plane, then I would, well, then the question becomes, well, are you starting from rough? And if you're only going to do it, then you might need a scrub plane. But for going that, I would say probably a number seven jointer. And mm -hmm. then you're going to have chisels. You're going to need at least, at least a quarter, half, and three quarter. And that'll get you by. Buy the IBC. Listen, if you buy junk chisels, you deserve everything you get. You have to spend your money and buy the best tools. We designed these. Why? Because we couldn't find what we wanted in any other chisel. Lee Nelson makes what I think is one of the nicest chisels out there. The problem is that it has never been solved. The handles fall off. So you just finished sharpening. You're walking back over, holding it by the handle, and next thing you know, the steel falls off. And as it's heading to the ground, the concrete floor, you say, do I stick my foot out there to prevent it from hitting the concrete floor and have a chisel in my leg, or do I let it hit tip first into the concrete? Not a decision I like having to make. Get the IBCs. And you can get beautiful mm -hmm. handles like that that a med made for us. So you have, right. to have, you have to have chisels. You need marking gauges. One, two, three. Get good ones. We make the best one I think you can get for the style of woodwork that I do. So if you see my method of laying out, or uh, cutting dovetails, you'll know how I use my marking gauge, and I built it for that very purpose. Um, what else do Saws. we hear? Saws. Saws, you need a dovetail, cross cut, and medium tenon. That's the bare necessities. This is for all of your dovetailing work. This is for anywhere where you're going to cut across the grain on what you would <coughs> call a finished cut. And a medium tenon is going to be for the deeper, heavier cuts that you would encounter when you're cutting the tenon. And then your squares. You need a couple of good squares. We found PEC to be the best value. They're not the cost of a sterret, yet they have the same tolerances, the best we can find out, as sterret at a fraction of the price. Uh, what else are you going to need over in here? Oh, that, the, that's going to that's be the bulk of your stuff. You know, you can spend a ton on clamps and other things, but... Yeah, I did a video on top 10 tools, so if you want to check that out. Okay, Freck, next. Oh, sorry. Freck, you're supposed to have that next one just like that, so we can bang through Well, these. I never know when you're going to finish. Sometimes you're But ramble. have the next one ready, so when I do finish, I'm, you can fire it off at me. <laughs> okay, uh, next up we have Jerry Pickering from San Diego, California. Why hey, does, Jerry. Why does one process the back of a chisel, but not the back of a plane blade when setting up the tool initially? Ah, uh, good question. I remember reading this one. So my friend David Charlesworth developed a technique called the Charlesworth Ruler Trick. I'm talking fast so I can get through this very quick. He did this way back in the early 1970s. Now, the back of a chisel is the jig of the tool. That means I want that back to be absolutely flat. So if I'm coming in here and I've got a, I've got a smooth something, let's say I've got a, uh, uh, I've got a dowel on there and I want to flush it off. I want to be able to set that chisel down there and I want to engage as soon as I touch. If I have to lift, 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 lift to finally get that to bite, then my back is not flat. The back of a chisel is the jig of the tool. Critical. When you chop like this, if your back is slightly curved, as you're chopping, your chisel is going to want to go off like that. You, I want that. I want to know exactly where that's going to go based on the flatness of the back. Now, that's a chisel. On a plane blade, that has no bearing whatsoever. If you prepare the back of a plane blade like you did a chisel, here's what you're going to end up doing. You're going to flatten this great big surface because you can't just flatten a little bit of it. You've got to do a whole lot of it. And you're spending all of your time polishing all of this. You're only going to use that. Well, the Charlesworth ruler trick involves taking a thin steel rule, elevating the blade slightly so that you can get away from all of this, but it's imperative that you have a polished surface here meeting a polished surface there. A cutting edge can only be go as good as the lesser of the two surfaces. Polish this one, ignore this one, then you have an edge that is the equivalent of that ignored side. 
but it doesn't have to be flat. It can be less than a degree elevated. You get a little polished strip right out there. You can hardly even see it. But that little polished strip meets that little polished strip, and it is just as good as if I had polished all of the bevel and all the back. There is no difference, except one takes 30 seconds, one takes three hours. Hopefully, if you don't understand that, um, we are, we, uh, I have several YouTubes out there that explain it, and we're going to do a couple of, uh, we're actually our uh, soon-to-be-done task is going to be making a very concise video on sharpening plane blades that you can go to, and when every time we make future videos, we can just reference back to it. So, hope that helps. Next. All right, next one comes from uh, Sean Aganina from Long Island, New York. Hi, Sean. Can you tell us about the plaque on your light stand on your bench? Oh, I'd be happy to. Also, any specific ways to practice cutting dovetails, or is it more repetition? Okay, let's do this first. Um, so, way back in 2016, when we decided to start the Purple Heart you Project. You go back further than that. I do, Jake, okay. if you give me a second here. <laughs> and uh, it was going to cost us a lot of money. Uh, we had the idea that we were going to bring in half the class as combat wounded vets. And this lady named Barb Lippick contacted me and she said, Rob, you're doing exactly what Bob would want you to do. Who's Bob? Well, I met this man a long time ago when I started doing the Woodshow Circuit. I'm going to say back in the early 2000, 2001. And he was just a, uh, he was a funny, great guy. He was just a guy that you'd want to be friends with. Older than me, played hockey. Everyone in Canada does. But I also come to find out that he was very wealthy, too. And, uh, but he was the type of guy that he, he did everything that uh, had to be done. So he manufactured underground mining equipment. And he would be all over the world. But he said, as he said, he goes, I go to places that nobody wants to go. Kidnapped a couple times. Just... Unbelievable stories, but also an extremely generous man. Unfortunately, uh, Bob died just a couple of weeks before he was to come to our class. He came to every class they ever taught, and his generosity knew no ends. It really was amazing. Well, about a year later, when we decided to do this, I'm not sure how Barb found out, but she, uh, she donated literally all of the money that we needed in order to run that class. And... Uh, this bench was actually for Bob. He had asked me to build him this bench, and then unfortunately, because of his death, he never took delivery, and I ended up keeping it. So I wanted to, uh, I wanted to commemorate Bob's um, generosity by having this plaque made and putting it on there. Bob Le Lippick, fellow, fellow friend, um, friend and fellow craftsman. And Bob was, everybody that knows Bob, will smile as soon as you mention the name because it's just the type of guy that he was. Fantastic. And Barb, if you're watching, um, thank you for uh, your generosity. And uh, I miss Bob, not as much as you do, I'm sure, but I miss Bob. He was a great guy. And dovetail, t read that part of yeah, the question any again. Any specific ways to practice cutting dovetails or is it more just repetition? Um, it's only repetition once you know what you should be practicing. If you repeat making a mistake, you're going to get really good at making that mistake. That doesn't do, help you do any good. So here's my quick, quick tips on dovetailing. Buy the right tools. If you don't have the right tools, you're spinning your tires. It's not, it doesn't make any sense. What is the right tool? You have to have a dovetail saw. This, is, this represents 70% of your ability to do the joint. My saw in particular? No, the dovetail saw. If it's a great saw, then you're going to have dovetails that are going to be perfect like these. First time. Philip Gustafson, first time dovetail. Look at this, Marshall Rommel, first time. Jake can hone in on there. You're not going to find any errors. The saw is 70% of the joint. It either cuts straight and true or it doesn't. If it cuts straight and true, then you don't have to do anything to that side. If it doesn't, you got to go in and fix it with a chisel. Good luck with that. I make the best saw, period. And I don't care if you think I'm being bold for saying that. We can prove it. Buy it and try it. You'll know. Number two is, uh, well, number, we'll finish number one. You've got to have the right tools. This is, they, this is how they, they rate in importance. Uh, saw is number one. Accurate marking gauge that actually works is number two. Uh, number three would be dovetail marking knife. And if you don't know this new technique that I have, then... You're, you're really missing the boat on, uh, on 
the best way to cut a dovetail. Number four would be a fret saw to more accurately and quickly remove the waste. Number five is going to be some decent chisels. The chiseling work is the weakest skill I see as I travel around and teach dovetails throughout the Western Hemisphere. And from there, the brand name doesn't matter as much. You want, you want a, uh, a pair of dividers. You want a dovetail marker. You need a mallet. You're going to want a steel hammer for putting them together. What am I forgetting there, Jake? Anything? Mm-mm. Now, 70% of your dovetail is, are the tools you're using. 20% is the technique. So that new technique that we have where you use the tailboard literally to start the kerfs for the pin board meant that we used to have the old way, we'd have three out of 12 people in a class doing a good job. The new way, we have eight or nine out of 12 doing a good job. Get it. If, if, look it up. Go to uh, Hand Cut Dovetails, A Different Approach, Part 1, Part 2, Part 3 on YouTube, and you'll find it. We'll put a link in there, Frick will. And number three, uh, pardon me, that's back up. 70% tools, 20% what I just told you, pr- the uh, technique. Only 10% is practice. How can I prove that? There wasn't enough time in a day to practice to make a difference on that or on that or any number of the samples that I have around here. Ask the guys. Get them to comment on there. Am I telling the truth? Yes. What the practice does, it makes you a little more efficient and it makes you quicker. But as far as getting a great dovetail, that is more to do with the tools you're using and the technique than all the practice. And yet, how many people tell you, oh, practice, practice, practice. No, you practice the wrong thing. You're just going to be terrible. Only really good at being terrible. Now you get me going. Next question. Frick. Great, you're not done. What, what did I forget? Tell him what he can do to practice. He should practice the, the cuts across no. the pin board. Well, he should take, he should, uh, we're going to do a virtual class. We're, we've got it figured out. Oh, my goodness, that thing is heavy. Um, so if you're, if you're, if you're going to, uh, all right, let's, let's put, I'll use this piece. Here's, here's some of the things that I would practice. Here's my piece of half-inch poplar. And somebody said, I read the other day, it was a good idea. If you're going to practice, practice in the wood that you're going to be cutting. That's, that's pretty good advice. I would say that if you're brand new, practice in a very easy-to-cut wood because an easy-to-cut wood will allow you to focus on technique without having to apply the muscle. So here's what my saw has these little tiny teeth up front. What's critical with the dovetail saw is this. If you can't start it, put a camera up to my face, please. If you can't start it accurately, I don't care how fast or slow it cuts. It's in the wrong spot. You may as well use a chainsaw if you're going to do it that way. It, you have to be able to put that curve exactly where you want it. So those little teeth at the front, I can see the flood of dovetails all over, so I'm going to get. Those little teeth at the front with very little, with actually a negative to 30 degree cutting face allow you to go in, and without any resistance, you can do that. And that's just enough to start it. So when you move to the big teeth, there's your speed. Okay? That is critical. A pistol grip is critical. Why? Because it registers in your hand the same way every time you pick it up. So, what? Am I yelling? Oh, pardon. Quite loud. Well, I'm loud. Um, So what I would do is just practice a whole bunch of this. Accurate lines. Don't be sloppy. And go in there and do this. Practice cutting on this side of the line. And practice cutting on this side of the line. This side of the line. And this side of the line. Get my picture? Get the drift? And then check it. When you make these cuts, somebody else asked this question. We didn't get to it. You want to use a six-inch rule. Make sure if you're using a combination square like this that that blade is up inside so it's not, it's not uh, giving you an I- incorrect reading. And then what you want to do is you want to practice until you can be within an eighth of an inch over six inches. I'm out a little less than a sixteenth. So by the time you work back to a half an inch, that's not even, that, that doesn't matter. Okay? That's what's most critical. The angles, they'll come. They're not a big deal. And the plum cuts, that almost takes care of itself with our new technique. So that's what I would do is practice. One side of the line, the other side of the line. One side of the line, the other side of the line. And you'll learn to straighten out your sawing. Pay attention to your stance. Nice, stable, three-point three point stance. One, two, feet more than shoulder width apart, and never let go of the board. That's your one, two, three. Milk stool analogy, remember? 
nice and stable, or a tripod. This has to line up. You start here, and you go right up to the shoulder. The elbow has to be underneath the shoulder, directly underneath it. If you're sawing with your elbow out here, poof, you're not going to be any good. So you've got to turn your body enough so that you can line that up, and then you have to pay attention that when you set your saw down, if it's not in the spot you want, you correct with your feet. You don't move your arm like this. Okay? Try to squeeze in one more, Frick. Well, this kind of goes on the same uh, topic. It's from Dean Rampey. Hi, Dean. He's uh, from Anchorage, Alaska. I, yeah. He has your dovetail saw. He I says, I'm, I am practicing my dovetails. I'm cutting down the full width of the blade. When I place a square against the work piece and the saw blade, how much of a gap at six inches is acceptable? Not, okay, so Dean, no more than an eight, but if I was cutting a three-tail joint, that's six cuts, I wouldn't want more, I wouldn't, maybe two that are out an eight. No more than that. You want to you wanna work to be better than that. And if you need to, practice on a thicker piece of wood that will give you a longer line. So when I do this, I'll end with this, I pray to create an anchor point with my opposite index finger and thumb. Get this finger out of the way. Squeeze like this, not like that. If you squeeze like that and press the saw against them, you're going to cut your finger with the set of the teeth. If you bring your fingers up like this, now the bump of the finger and thumb are above the set of the teeth. So as I press the saw laterally, and I've always got some light lateral pressure so that it won't wiggle one way or the other, then I'll move it like this into position. So now all I see on the right side of the blade is pencil mark. No wood, just pencil mark. Then I start my cut. Away I go. Use all of your blade. Don't dull, your, dull the middle part of your saw prematurely. Use all of your blade. Check it, and you should be within an eighth. Now that, that one is uh, about a sixteenth, so it seems like that's all I'm so going to hit tonight. You should tell them that they can only have one, maybe two out and eight I did, in I said the that. same direction. Right. Yeah. G aim for perfection. Aim for perfection. But if you're out a si if you're out an eighth of an inch over six inches on one, it's not a big deal. But as Jake's saying, if if one side is out an eighth of an inch this way and the other one's out an eighth of an inch that way, well, that's going to compound it and make it even worse. So shoot, aim for perfection. Listen, anybody can do this. If you can tie your shoes, if you got, if you got that much manual dexterity, and your interest level is up here. You will get this. Get my saw. Why? Because it is designed by someone who cuts dovetails. So it works. Not to mention, 10% of our saw sales support our Purple Heart Project. Thank you very much. Now, I think we're out of time. I know we're out of time. My dinner's sitting out there. It's been there for two hours. But I'd love to stay on here. Let's do this again. Let's plan to do this once a month. I think this is great. I enjoy the interaction. I love being able to spew my stuff. Hopefully you're benefiting from it. I love the Purple Heart Project. It is, it is my mission in life is to do this, and I will do it as long as I'm alive. Join me. Be part of it. And as, uh, as uh, uh, Jax has discovered, it just when you do it, there is no other feeling outside of the, your immediate family. You just can't describe what it makes you feel like. And it has nothing to do with money or anything else. It's just that feeling you get when you're doing something you know is helping someone else now we got to do our draw yeah don't just forget uh, to support our program tell everybody you know about the purple heart project so that sooner or later that person that needs to hear finds out and we end up being able to bring him or her to our class what's up Frick? just uh you haven't shown the prizes since yeah the beginning, so oh all right so if did they register we didn't even mention that we yeah we have 486 okay so last chance if you want to be in on the draw, you don't have to make a donation. just have to put your name in. We're going to give away three bottles of the finest New Brunswick maple syrup. Do you want to show them the nutrition facts? <laughs> no. It tastes fantastic. That's all you need to know. It's dark maple syrup. I can barely part with it. And we'll have it up on our site when? Tomorrow. Tomorrow you'll be able to buy it. Don't hold back. Today you can only win it. Yes, today you can win be it. The first. Or you buy something that's big enough to go in a box, you'll get a little taste, a, a little sample, and it'll drive you crazy like it did to Michael. So here's what, and then our big prize is going to be our uh, half blind. So this is a half blind. And in order to do that and do it well, you need a couple of new tools. One is the Kerf X10, and we make these right here in the shop. I can't open this up. Maybe I can with a screwdriver. 
the Kerfex stand helps you go in. If you haven't seen it work, look it up on YouTube. It's it's squared off. <coughs> Excuse me. Doesn't have teeth, and it goes in and it finishes the cut. It's amazing what it does. I would not want to cut dovetails without it. I did recently, accidentally, and what a pain. And when you're cutting a half blind, you've got to be able to get into those corners. And Jake grinds these by hand. Look at that precision. In fact, I saw a picture he put on Instagram where he lined up a whole bunch of them, and you can't tell that they weren't done by machine. But this one chisel allows you to get into the left corner and into the right corner. And more importantly, when you're cutting through end grain, which is such a hard cut, it keeps your line of force straight on. Skew chisels require you have it tilted like this, which makes it even harder. Two tools you would not want to be out if you're going to do half blinds. And, and um, Sean Mahaffey makes these for us. This is purple infused resin impregnated maple, nice and heavy and hard. And that's the actual purple of the purple heart, which I thought was cool. So let's do the draw. Do the maple syrup first. I want to thank Rex, my son, back here, who's been helping us tonight. We're a family affair during this coronavirus. Frick, who was uh, responsible for all of the uh, technical side of things. Good and bad. Who's responsible? Yeah. Jake with the Everyone camera. And we've got, is, is Ken on tonight? Yeah, he is. Yep. And Ken Anthony, who's been uh, helping remotely. And Luther, is Super Dave on? Did he ever make oh it? Oh, yeah. yeah he's been Super Dave Benson. The team. And I can't forget Angie. Angie, if you look on our website, it's part of our team as well. She does all the packaging of the T-shirts. All right, we ready? Yep, go ahead. So maple syrup number one is going to Gene Dixon. Where? You don't know where? Okay. Well, I can look that up all after. Right. Yeah. Gene Dixon, congratulations. Maple syrup number two. Maple syrup number two is going to Josh Faust. Josh, congratulations. Maple syrup number three. Kenneth Dove, Lance, goes by Lance. Lance, maple syrup number number three. That was three. That was five hundred. What? That was number three. Yeah. Five hundred millimeters of pure deliciousness. And finally, the grand prize goes to Jerry Sarkozy. Hey, Jerry. Congrats. Yes, congratulations. Hope you enjoy it. If you don't have a dovetail saw, well, you know how to fix that. All right, so next Saturday night, same time, same place, we're going to back to work on Angie's box. We're going to be working on the drawer, the side-hung drawer. Looking forward to that. We release the YouTube every day of the week to keep you entertained. And if you would like to try out our online workshop, go and look at a previous video. We'll put a link up where you can go in and use a special code. And your first month is free on us. And just so everybody knows, uh, with the help of Luther, we're trying to take our uh, YouTube channel to the next level. So uh, we need everybody to, of course, like the video, subscribe, hit the bell, the notification bell, so you're notified when we go live and when we release a new video. And uh, we're looking into some things. We haven't done it yet, but we're looking to really amp up our YouTube channel. So thank yeah, you, everybody. Yeah, I appreciate your feedback, too. And thanks for all the donations. It's been great. We've uh, paid for a vet, so... Uh, and then some. So that's good too. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you, folks. Appreciate it. Please remember, see us next Saturday night. Tell any combat wounded vet, tell everyone you know, the Purple Heart Project and how good wood can be in helping these people. We'll talk more about it every time we do this. Have a good night.